Okay, I think we're going to get started here. So we'll try to start early enough to have a, a lot more time left for the main presenter this evening. So if you don't know me, I'm Jane Offsinger. So I'm the current president of the St. Louis Woodworkers Guild. I'm very um, happy to be doing that and, and looking forward to a great year. Um, so um, we're to, to begin with, I'm sorry, Doug. It so happens that Hal, Hal Donovan just happened to figure this out. Uh, but about almost exactly three years ago was the date of our very first Zoom, or uh, what do you call it, projected live streamed um, uh, business meeting, or not business meeting, regular meeting. And the reason for that, that becoming a necessity was COVID. So we, we had, it was almost a whole year, if I remember right, that we did not have any in-house um, meetings. And so that was, it just so, so happened to be three years ago. And so we have kept the idea of doing it even though we've gone to live meetings again. It just so happened that at that first one, uh, it was Don Turner who happened to be the presenter at that meeting, and he's going to be the presenter again tonight then. Um, just an explanation for those of you who don't, haven't been here before or don't really know the, the system. Uh, we are going to have a show and tell, and the show and tell is items that you have brought in to show, and there is a log that you should come in and just put down your name and what the item is going to be so that when we get to that point, which is near the end, just before the presentation, uh, I'll have that and I can call you up to the uh, microphone or you get, get in the line and so on. So there's a log right here on the table. I don't see a whole lot of things sitting there right now. I don't know how many show and tells we're going to have. But that's how that works. Um, and the monthly raffle. Uh, somebody has been going around. I know Joe Turner is at least one of them. And uh, trying to pawn off. I see a lot of tickets around there too, which is good. Uh, the whole purpose of the raffle is to give you guys a chance of getting uh, some freebies, uh, usually at least two uh, gift certificates, one to Woodcraft and one to Rockler. But we have an, another one this time. If you remember the last monthly meeting, um, the gentleman who was presenting uh, turned this spalted, what, what was the wood? Spalted hackberry. hackberry, sorry. Turned this right during the presentation and so on. And he left it for us to actually give to somebody. And it's going to be in the raffle. So you have three things that you might get. One of the two gift certificates. And the other is to get this handmade uh, or turn, turn spalted hackberry uh, bowl then. So that's, again, going to be at the, just before the presentation. So we'll come to that. OK, to begin with, um, we don't have as many people as we often do here, but I bet you there are some people who have not been here before. So if there are any e new either members who have signed up to be a member or just visitors to our guild meeting uh, one at a time, or if you hold your hand up, do we have the access to a portable microphone? Yes. Guys, OK. So if you, do, if you are new in any way, shape, or form, hold your hand up. We'll bring you a mi microphone. And just tell us a little bit about how you heard about the Guild, maybe, uh, what you have done in the past, uh, what you think, hope to get out of uh, joining the Guild, or if you do join the Guild. Uh, so anybody? Uh, so. Ken Smith, and uh, I'm retired, been retired about 10 years, and um, I've been woodworking on and off for probably 20, but just getting back into it in the last year. And uh, my current project is a jewelry box for my oldest granddaughter. So, so those kind of things. Just want to learn. Come here and learn. So thank you. We've got a lot of people to learn from here. <laughs> Anybody else? OK. Hi, I'm Randy Schlake. I live just a little ways from here. And I retired about nine months ago. And I've been meaning to get involved with the group for a long time. I'm, I talk to people at Faust Park when there were some events over there. And my wife suggested she saw the ad online for the auction, I think, coming up Saturday. So she suggested this is a good month to come over here because the third Thursday of every month, you remember that. And I, I remember that. I think nine months is maybe her limit. I haven't been in the house <laughs> all the time. Thank you. Welcome.
Hi, uh, my name is Bruce Shago. I've been retired about four years now. I happened to run into Joe Turner at uh, at Rockler the other day, and he gave me the the pamphlet. So, um, anyway, I've been I come from five generations of carpenters, and I'm kind of the black sheep. I'm a, uh, an engineer retired, and uh, but I uh, I hated doing woodworking when I had to, had to, but I've been wor woodworking now for 40, 40 years or so for fun. I build mostly cabinets and mantles and shelving and things around the house, that sort of thing. Not too much furniture. Thank you. Welcome. I think there's somebody over here. I'm Miriam Wiegand. I'm here with Miles Farrell. Uh, I've, I've enjoyed woodworking since uh, shop class in uh, middle school, and um, we've got some home improvement projects. Hi, my name's Miles Farrell. Uh, not a new member, but it's been like six years since we've been here. Uh, unfortunately, not retired yet. Um, got about 25 years of that and rebuilding both houses, so mostly cabinets. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome. Anybody else? Any other new people tonight? Okay. We had a most wonderful uh, superstar weekend for this year's superstar. I think last year was the year that the guy that was supposed to come backed out about a week before it was supposed to be held. So that was very, very disappointing. Certainly wasn't disappointing this year. Dan Lender, your hand up, <laughs> was uh, really completely in charge of uh, planning this. He started in August, if I remember right, and has worked diligently from August all the way until the actual event itself occurred. Um, with, he had a lot of help at the end for like carrying things and so on. Uh, Woodcraft provided the tools that we needed, um, uh, loaned, us, loaned them those tools and so on, major tools. Uh, the the uh, invitee was Tom McLaughlin, um, and I think we ended up having 32 actual members of ours, which is a pretty re reasonable number uh, at, the, at the actual event, and 12 or 13 or whatever people came the night before to a dinner where we got to know Tom a little bit better then. Uh, so I think it was an absolutely uh, spectacular program. I think most of the people, I don't, haven't heard anybody that was there that didn't feel the same way. And we <coughs> certainly thank uh, Dan. Um, and then I think it was Adam Connor that took the photographs that, that are in the, the uh, bulletin, the, or the newsletter that you just have. The, I think those pictures are in there. And the nice news for you is that Dan has agreed to do the same thing next year. Um, so he will may be asking for suggestions of people to come. Uh, so anyway, it was uh, quite a success, we think. So upcoming classes and presentations. So Bill Shukat. We have a number of uh, classes coming up uh, for beginners. There is a new beginners class in, I think, June 3rd. There, we have a fundamentals class that is about three quarters done, and a new fundamentals class beginning in July. Um, for anybody interested in making furniture, uh, that's what the fundamentals class is about, is how to work wood in a way that you can build a piece of furniture when you're done without beating it with a hammer. Um, we have some new classes coming up in the fall. Um, there's going to be a class on building a mox and, vent, a mox and vice. Uh, and there's going to be a class on building jigs to work with hand planes, like a shooting, plane, a shooting board. Um, for those of you who might not have a bench, uh, there's a class coming up in August um, for how to build a sturdy bench for 75 bucks. And that's all contingent on Home Depot's prices, but today's prices would, would make that work. Um, there are some classes coming up like jewel, uh, veneer jewelry box. Uh, so there's something for everybody, lots of, lots of classes coming up. And they're posted on... And they're all posted on the website. 
I don't know if he mentioned it, but Bill is the vice president and has been so for several several years too. Okay. Um, so that microphone we might pass around if you want to. So Rick Weissman is back there, and he's the head of the toy program, and maybe he can at least give us an update of the current numbers since the last our last meeting. We gave out to the hospitals um, 125 toys this month, and um, we, I didn't count the number, but there's a number of toys here on the table for uh, next month to give out. And if someone that called me happens to be here that wanted some wheels and axles, I have them over here at the table. So this has been an incredibly successful program over the years. I know in the newsletter right now the actual up-to-date numbers of not just what's happened since the last meeting, but in our lifetime, how many toys that we did, but it's, an, it's a very, very, it's so. Um, Wayne Humphrey, if you, you have anything to say at all about the Christmas toy program, you got a microphone already, okay? Yeah, we're building Christmas toys tomorrow out of Fast Park from 10 to 2. Uh, we've got 300 and something in inventory now. We'll put another 50 in after tomorrow's build. And uh, Toys for Tots is going to do a pickup uh, early July. They have a uh, uh, Christmas in July event uh, to distribute toys. So uh, we're going to be getting rid of some of our inventory then. If you're building anything at home and you can get it into us by then, uh, we'll include some into that distribution, and then the rest of it will be distributed later on uh, sometime around Thanksgiving to different charities. Thank you. Any questions for Wayne? Let, let me jump in. I forgot something. Okay. Somebody didn't no give me my cheat sheet. Um, we had a toy build over at the Wal uh, West Ridge Elementary School. We had 76 fifth graders building toys. Um, we've had a little QC in the wake of that, and about half of them have been fixed. <laughs> no more wheels glued to bod car bodies, etc. cetera. Um, but the folks over there had such a good time, and the kids had such a good time, uh, that they want to do it again. We don't have timing set for that. Uh, but I'm going to be looking for volunteers to help build toy kits so that we can have one of these again next year. Uh, Tom Turney is uh, working on the home sweet home table build. Yes, uh, and it's going very well, Jay. Uh, we do have wood out in the truck. We, we have a few pieces. I've got more in the shed. Uh, I'll be there a couple hours on Saturday at the uh, swap meet. Uh, we get wood in the shed, out of the shed, and you could drop off a table uh, at the shed. Um, so I encourage anybody that's never built a table or wants to build a table, learn how to get involved. It's a great way to build your skills, and uh, you know it's a good program. Uh, helps the community a lot. So thanks, Jay. Oh, anybody have any questions? Okay, thanks. Thanks, Tom. I know it's not on the program here yet, but I'll forget it otherwise. So Grady Vaughn is our uh, newsletter chair, and he has been looking into trying to get us some new uh, handout cards, not business cards, but something like that or so. We seem to be pretty much out of them. I don't know how that happened, but we're pretty much out of them. So we, we're looking into um, getting some new ones. Woodcraft and Rockler all the time are bugging us to get them some more. I bet you a lot of our business, well, not business, a lot of our new members that find out about the Guild do so by way, way of going into one of those woodworking stores and being told about us and so on. And we don't have anything to hand them and so on. So we need to get some more of them made. He's just kind of looked into it and uh, the cost seems to be a lot higher than to begin with. I think it was something in the neighborhood of four of the two bids. It was about 450 bucks to make, that was only 1500 The one that was 3,000 cards or things was about seven, 770. 770. 
The reason we're even mentioning it here is that we, we are working on it, so we're going to try to get some new things to hand out, is if any of you or any of the people online uh, know people that are in the business of doing copies and so on, do you happen to have a, a friend that you could, we could call in a favor or whatever and tell them how, how good the, uh, we are and so on, if we could find a much better deal than that just by knowing the right person and so on, please talk to Grady and uh, that, <laughs> that would be very helpful. Okay. The other uh, definite thing to put on calendars and so on is our annual guild picnic is going to be in Faust Park this year uh, and it's going to be on September the 9th um, and it will include tours of some of the buildings and so on in Faust Park if I remember, right? And Bill, uh, Bill Shukat is the one who you need to talk to about volunteering and asking him what he needs what he needs extra things and so on to kind of coordinate this, okay? And it, yes, there, are, there is going to be a tour and so on, or several tours. We do a lot of community outreach, as you have seen several examples of now. Of the many emails that the president and vice president get asking for help with whatever, um, we, I happen to get one, who, who, is, who is the chairman or the president or the head honcho of the St. Louis Astronomical Society. Didn't know there was one, but he is. That's what he does. In fact, he's a, more of a regional coordinator. He's a big, he's a big guy in this, the, the whole thing. They have a program where they work with libraries in the metropolitan area. So both in Missouri, he lives in Missouri, but also in, in, in Illinois as well, where I live, where the libraries uh, purchase, as they're part of this program, they know about it and so on, they purchase a telescope at a much reduced rate because they can get it a lot cheaper than you, could, you or I could get it on our own. One of the members of the society takes that telescope when it comes in and modifies it. <laughs> and they modify it in a way that it makes it more durable, number one, as well as more user-friendly. That's, that's a good thing for a lot of us. Uh, and they are, they're located then in these libraries. I just found out that O'Fallon, Illinois Library has about five or six of them, matter of fact. I think there are more than five of them right now in the various uh, uh, libraries around. They are treated like a book in that you can, uh, there's a waiting list almost all these places. You can sign up to, to borrow one, to take one of these on loan and so on and then give it back, just like, just like you do a book and so on. So they wondered, he wondered, uh, so this is, I was going to tell you this was my show and tell, the telescope. So this is the telescope, obviously. This is the base. The base is separate, and it is wood, but it's not really wood. It's like smooshed up. What, what kind of, what, there's so many names, particle board or one of those things, uh, and it's not very strong. What happens is occasionally, that's happened three times this year, is that somebody will drop it. This actually, I think, was dropped by somebody in the library, not from the person who was uh, getting it loaned to. And it, the base breaks. Telescopes don't break, but the base breaks and so on. This one just broke, and you can see the particle board or whatever you want to call it fiber board or whatever, it's not very strong, being that thin and so on. It just breaks off. And they would like to know whether we might be interested in partnering with them in the sense of being their repository of when that's, this happens, or maybe to have some extra pieces on, um, in, in hand to begin with, just the wood pieces. So there's actually this, 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 and this. The other part that breaks frequently, is the lazy Susan bottom there because it sticks out a little bit and frequently when it drops that just breaks off and so on. They need to replace it. The, you know about the chain of, um, what do we call it, supply chain <laughs> issues that everybody's having? They have them too. So it may take them three or four months to get a replacement part that they're actually purchasing from the people who make this base to begin with. And that's three or four months that that I mean, some of these uh, libraries only have one. Um, so he's asking whether people as a group or individual people within a group 
would be willing to and capable of making these individual wood pieces. And I guarantee you they wouldn't be made out of that stuff. Um, but if they're made out of some solid wood and so on, I think that might take care of the problem in the future. I doubt that it's, if it drops, I bet it's not going to break off like that, though. Uh, so my question is, I know this would have to end up being approved as a whole community outreach program by the board and so on, but he actually gave me one of these to actually bring in. Uh, so it is a show and tell in that sense. If everybody can come up and kind of look and kind of get, get an idea of the interest or non-interest and so on in doing this. I even have a, a question of the CNC people and so on as to whether or not CNC could just if you get the, the program or whatever to make each one of these four different pieces and so on, and it's handy and so on, could, uh, do we or do we not still have an active group of CNC? I, I don't know. Yeah, you could make these by hand too, obviously, each one of those pieces, but they'd go a lot quicker if, and uh, duplicatory. They would be the same every time if it could be, could be done that way. So just in raise of hands, uh, just a second, Tom. Are they all the same, or is there an iteration of parts or different? No, this is it. This is it, okay, it's great. It's the same telescope because they tell them this is the only telescope to buy. Okay, and the only base. modified and so on, and the wood pieces, this base, we're talking about this. Yeah. And there's only four pieces there. Great. Definitely C&C, Don. <laughs> it's, her, it's her the rest of the evening and so on. I can't leave it here, but... Uh, but I'll, I'm going to have it with me, or my house, and so on um, for a while. But I do need to give him an answer about whether we think that we can take this project on. My question is, are all the bases the same? Yes. So we could this make MDF templates, and people could just use routers to make yeah. one particular part, make a yeah. hundred of them. Exactly. Show of hands, general, general yes, yes, or think. Okay, Did, show of hands, yes, no. So I might, I think there's enough board members here that would be a quorum if we were having a meeting. I might just send out a, a, a yes or no to get a, the board kind of approval just to move forward on this. That's what I'm talking about then. Jay, do you have a sense of how many total we're looking to make? Only three of them have been broke this year. Right. I'd say if we made like 10 each of the different parts to have them and so on, give them what he needs and then he could just, it, it might be an ongoing project. Yeah, okay. Although if he gets enough of them replaced with that crap with, the, with real wood, they might, it might, the number might go down. Sure. Okay. Something, give you an idea of how many in a year, let's say it's four or five of them. Or <laughs> any other questions? Okay, go ahead. Just a few announcements. Um, a lot of you, I bet, have bought replacement uh, plane irons from Ron Hawk. He's been making them for over 40 years, uh, personal, personal business and so on. Have you? And haven't some of you got? Yeah, they're wonderful, excellent quality. Um, he, like a lot of us, is getting older. And he and his wife decided they won't, don't want to continue to be fully involved and fully in charge of this operation. The good news is he happens to be a personal friend of people at Lee Valley, maybe one of the head honchos at Lee Valley. So Lee Valley, a Canadian company, has indeed decided to take over the production of, in exactly the same um, uh, they may, you know, everything, D done the same way he's been doing them. So they will be available, but not through Ron Hawk. Don't know if that's happened yet or not, because he wanted to do it by, the, uh, by March, so it might have already happened, but I just wanted to let you know, if you need new planes and so on, you can probably, you can get them, but they won't be doing it directly. By the way, when you would call Ron on the phone, he would answer. Um, the other thing is, I have, an, uh, overabundance of red oak lumber that's been dried for 20 years or so above my shop um, with crude and everything. The boards look wonderful. I think Tom Turney will attest to the fact that it's good quality wood because when he was completely out of the white oak being used for the tables and so on, I said, I got this. And so he came and picked up oak of, of this lumber. 
So some of you might have got red oak, uh, same red oak uh, for whatever you might have made and so on. And uh, I would like to have it go away. <laughs> and I'm not talking about selling it, I'm talking about giving it away. But you have to come and get it. So it does, it, it, it's heavy when you start putting those. I think it's 5'4 mostly, it's a little more than an inch yes. thick. Yes. Mostly 5'4 stock. And most of them are actually about 10 feet long. Now you could cut them down and do whatever, whatever you want to. But I, if anybody's uh, needing or interested in uh, getting good, really, really dry red oak lumber, uh, I might be able to help you out. In fact, it would help me out too. Okay, so now, I don't know if anybody, did anybody sign up for show and tell? Okay, let me get the names here. Go, all three of you, all three of you go ahead and come up. Okay, I, I, it's not something I built, it's a hack, okay? Uh, if any of you have delta uh, planers, okay, 12 inch data delta planers, I did, I bought mine without a dust collection and it creates dust. Okay, so uh, I was trying to find an easy solution to the problem, okay? And I saw something on YouTube and tried it, and it works. This is a 14 inch shop vac dust uh, pickup, okay? Floor pickup kind of thing. It fits perfectly on there, and uh, it, it's got a two and a half inch hose on the end, okay? You just put it right on, it's just a couple of screws. I put a couple of uh, some double sided tape just to fill the holes and it works perfectly. I just uh, did five boards and had just a little bit of dust on, the, on my thing. I don't have to take it outside and do it anymore. I can do it in my shop without creating a lot of dust. So. Bill Shucott. This is a hall table that I built since the holidays. Uh, it goes behind a sofa in my den. I lost a pole in transit here, so that I have to get repaired. Um, I bought a set of plans from Fine Woodworking. The uh, Fine Woodworking plans had this as a curve, and I didn't like that, so I changed it around. Um, saved a lot of hours. Yeah, I saved a lot of hours <laughs> and a lot of wood, a lot of cherry. Um, the top is made from a board. A uh, single board that I got from Don Snyder uh, before he moved out of his house. Uh, so it had some sentimental value. Uh, I wrote about this project on the forum because I was having problems with the shellac finish, uh, having ridges in it. Uh, I got a lot of nice suggestions from various members of the guild. Um, the one that seemed to be best was from uh, Ron Bonce, uh, who said he thought I was, it was drying too fast and getting uh, brush marks. Uh, so I, I probably applied six or seven coats of shellac to this, uh, having to successively uh, sand out the, the ridges. Um, but I ultimately uh, sprayed it with shellac in a rattle can. Uh, and, and that worked fine. Um, I have an extra breadboard end from the one that I screwed up if anybody wants one. <laughs> <laughs> Questions? What's the word? Please, please uh, speak into a, a microphone and you can, he'll pass it around here. You yes, know, the reason the board we, was, it's, it's cherry wood. The reason we ask you to do this, we've been mentioned before, is we're also putting this out online, and they don't have a clue um, what's hap happening unless they are able to hear the questions that are being asked. So that's why we're pretty adamant about trying to have the questions also be into a microphone that gets recorded. You're, you had a question, I think. Somebody did. Yeah, there's a microphone. I was just asking what wood it was, and he already answered. Any other questions of Bill? Next. Right. Beautiful, Bill. I see these wonderful things in, uh, in emails that I get. And this one I got from, uh, from Tay Tools. 
Taylor Tools out in Colum Columbia, and they have some really neat stuff. But they had this thing which was kind of a poor man's um, domino thing. So I went ahead and I, I bought the kit, and it comes with all of the hardware you need. It didn't come with these clamps. What they wanted you to do was really dumb, and so I didn't do that. So I went ahead and I made this, and uh, what I didn't figure on when I made this was the router that I have at home. Yes, sure, all the little parts and pieces only cost me $34, which wasn't bad, and I did scrap wood and stuff, and it, it, you know, it works, but the problem was is my router, any one of my four routers that I have wouldn't fit. I couldn't use it. So I had to go buy another one. <laughs> well, what the funny thing about this thing is, that, hey, then this one's really neat. It only cost me everything. It comes with the, the router base, um, the, um, that base, the regular base, uh, really nice, was only $79. When I looked <laughs> to buy just the plunge base, for my, uh, for my DeWalt, they wanted $119 for it. And I went, hell, I'll buy a new router. Exactly. <laughs> so, but it really works neat. It, it does take a little bit of, um, of getting it centered to where, you, to where you can use it, but I've used it now for a mortising one. Uh, you just use my mortises, uh, cut my tendons by hand, use that for the mortise and that's fine, and then just playing around. Um, I did use it as a, as a domino, and uh, one fit really tight, and the other one's really good, but, you know, for, well, something that should have cost 35 bucks, which cost pretty close to $100, after I went out and bought four of these things. <laughs> it's really, it's, it's for, uh, for the, like the dominoes and stuff, it was really neat, it was, it was pretty neat to build. I learned some things about um, uh, v, uh, the uh, V grooves, and it was pretty neat. Great. <laughs> Any questions of Brian? Any questions? Thank you so All much. Right. You know, used to what he said about how much it ultimately costs. I don't know if it's still true or not, but uh, if you have a DeWalt power screwdriver or driver and, and drill and so on, if you could just go get a two-pack of new batteries, it used to be true that if you went and bought a new um, drill uh, with t two batteries, it costs less than you buying just the two batteries. That used to be true. I don't know if it still is or not. But anyway, look, look for those kinds of things. Well, my goal was to get to the presentation by 7.30, and we pretty darn close, got, got, almost got to that goal. So I'd like to present uh, to you uh, Mr. Don Turner. Don Turner has been a longtime member of the Guild. In fact, he was a director um, and um, on the guild for the last four years. He just uh, went le left that. He does a lot of furniture making himself. In fact, he w decided to go into business and he was going to make both furniture items as well as cabinets, but mainly the, the uh, calling was for cabinets. So he, he has a business is called, if I get this right, Turner Handcrafted Furniture. Okay. So, um, and as you might have figured out with the other things when we talked about the telescope, he's an absolute guru in, in CNC and so on as well. So without further ado, Don. All right. You got your own. All right, well, good evening, everybody. As uh, Jay said, I'm gonna do a presentation on kitchen cabinets and bathroom vanities. They're kind of cousins of each other. One, some are a little deeper on the kitchens and the vanities are, the kitchen ones are 24 inches on the lowers and 21 for vanities. But anyway, I'm just gonna do some design practices and ideas and things I've run into as I've, as I've worked this, uh, on this job. Um, my background is uh, I'm a retired electrical engineer, technology manager. Uh, I've enjoyed working, doing woodworking since high school and I've been doing it for a scary number of years. I don't even want to say how many, it's just forever. Um, I haven't figured out retirement. I don't understand it. So instead of retiring, I started a business in 2016. Um, I've built a few furniture pieces, but mostly it's everybody wants cabinets, vanities. That's what they want. 
Um, I've partnered with another person who works with me because unfortunately I only have two arms and I don't have enough to hold it and drill and do everything. So I have another person I work with that helps me uh, do the installations more than anything. So we'll go through some basics and design work. Um, I do use a CAD program. It is really, really helpful. Can you do it without CAD? Yes, it's possible. Um, it can be done. But um, it really reduces the number of errors because as you build things, you're going to be in many, many parts. And if you're building a kitchen, you need to get field measurements of the room and where the doors are and all that to, to where your cabinets will fit. And so what it does is it'll reduce the number of errors you have, plus you can provide a rendering or you can provide plans so that you can see what it's going to look like when it's installed. A medium-sized kitchen, you're going to be making 400 parts. That's a 15-cabinet kitchen. And that's just an just a average kitchen. You go in, go home, look at your kitchen. That's how many parts you're probably going to have to make when you machine your, your cabinets. But you get to get the sizing of the drawers right. The doors have to fit the face frames and boxes. All that's got to fit. And if you're using, uh, I'm going to talk about bloom slides, you've got to be dead on, otherwise they won't slide right. So you've got to make your measurements right. And the CAD program is just so helpful for it. Uh, there's lots of CAD projects available. Uh, we have the SketchUp, which I think is very popular here. SolidWorks, I use TurboCAD. Uh, there's AutoCAD, et cetera. It goes on and on and on forever. But I use TurboCAD. Um, there are lower cost versions probably of all these. TurboCAD has a standard. Deluxe, I think, is the entry level 3D. They have the professional and the platinum, which is you can design anything from submarines to spacecrafts to cabinets. Um, I, did, I do have the top version because I want to do renderings for my customers. so. They can walk in the room and look around in the computer, and I haven't cut any wood yet. So they can say, well, I really wanted some drawers there, and I wanted a door there, and so I can switch it around, and I haven't cut any wood yet. So it really helps with that. And they know what they're going to get when they, when they see the canvas installed. They're going to look just like the rendering, because I take that rendering, that model, and just drop it into, um, into shop uh, drawings that I take down in the shop. Um, if you choose to go to the CAD, ro CAD route, yes, there is a learning curve, but you know it's it it will pay off in spades. It just it is so worth it. And then don't forget you got YouTube. You can go on YouTube and they'll show you how to use whichever one of these you choose to to have. And for example, I just finished a kitchen yesterday that I installed, and these are all the diagrams that I have. And I take it down in the shop and I check off these parts. And as I use it, you can see they're all beat up and marked up because uh, I make printouts. And then as I make the parts, I check off the part. Because remember, you're making 400 parts. It's, a, it's an accounting issue. You've got to keep track of all these parts and where they're going. And I'll show you a little technique I use to keep track of everything. But I'll just, I'll just brought these in. You can look at them. See, I put a note in there to ask the customer a question because I wanted to know if, where they wanted to locate the the uh, drawers and so on. Well, you can take a look at them. They're all beat up, and after tonight, they'll get thrown away. Um, I also, because um, I can print out as many as I need, because I have a CNC machine, I do tool paths. So for adjustable shells, you have the little holes in there to move the pins up and down, and I put that on the CNC. So I put the name of the tool path and where it's going to be and where the axis is, and then I can slap it on the machine and cut everything out. So. Um, you can also do it with a router, which I did before my CNC days. But uh, it, it just really is very helpful because you can just work to these diagrams. And if you build, build to these dimensions, it's going to work. And the drawer is going to fit. And it's going to fit in the, in the space that you've designed it for. So that's just a huge, huge deal. So here's a cabinet anatomy for a lower cabinet. So these are the sides. This is a face frame I usually build. I put it together with, um, with pocket screws, it, you know, the Craig jig you can buy in, you can buy in uh, Home Depot if you want. That's where I got mine at Lowe's or whatever. And then so the, the sides here, and then we have the backs. And then I put a couple braces in here, which most cabinets don't have, but I like the fact that it's very sturdy because I can build the box, and then I put the face frame on the box. But I spray 
Typically, nowadays, all the cabinets are sprayed a white or some color. They're not a wooden color. So I spray this and get this right, and then I buy plywood that is finished on one side, and I put the boxes together with the plywood, and then, I, and then once I spray this and it's ready to go, then I glue it onto the, onto the, uh, to, to complete the cabinet, so I complete the cabinet. So there's a face frame, toe kick, there's a backer for it, because I want it, if you actually bump it, I want it to have a real solid feel to it, because I want to, my whole deal is I want to build a really high quality cabinet. Uh, these are typically three-quarter inch floor all the way around, except the back one in the back. The guy I work with, he does the plumbing and so on, and he told me, please stop making three-quarter inch backs because it takes forever <laughs> to get through them. So I said, all right, I'll give you your half-inch backs. So that's, that's what I did. The other nice thing about these frames is I actually screw into the back of the frames here, and then I do a pocket screw here into the face frame and pocket screw into the floor into the face frame in the bottom. And that's what I do here. And then I put one clamp, once this drives, I put a clamp on the two sides and that sticks the glue together. So I do glue it, everything together as a solid piece. And this is the upper cabinet. Actually, let me go back to the lower cabinet and I'll show you. So I made a little model on the CNC. I just took the CAD program and just shrunk it down. And so this is kind of what it looks like. It, um, these are the, again, it's, We'll say it's kind of to scale, but it's not exactly to scale. But I uh, machined the sides and so on out of, a, out of a, on the CNC. But I made a couple doors here, and it don't have the legitimate hinges. But this is kind of what it looks like. It gives you an idea of, of what it will look like if you actually built one. It's just bigger, and this would be 24 inches here, and then 34. I make it 34 and 5 8 so the dishwasher will fit in on these lowers. This is a kitchen cabinet model, but it could be a, could just as easily be a, uh, a vanity, just make it just a little thinner, just 21 inches instead of 24. So that's what, this is what that looks like, and I'll, you can come up and look at these little models when I get done. Okay, and so this is an upper, so if you imagine it's like that, and so, um, Got the same setup. I do have a recessed part in here, and that's down here. The backs, I do make three quarter inch because I'm, uh, I'm paranoid about the strength of the cabinet because all the weight's gonna, you're gonna put screws in here into the studs and I want it to have strength because you load this up with dishes, it's gonna have some serious weight on it. So, uh, so three quarter inch all the way around and then I make uh, three quarter inch um, shelves because I don't want them to sag. And I don't, I have yet to ever make one. All the ones I have don't have a centerpiece in here. So it's all, um, it's basically a wide open. And then I just make these, you know, make these little, right for a little dollhouse, but those are the, you know, so those go in and those are the, so that's what, how that works. And so I'm going to talk about some of the details on these, why we've got some of these funny little things, tabs and things that I got there, and I'll get to that here in a minute. So that's the uppers. And when you make the lower sides, again, this is 23 and one quarter inches. And then when you put the face frame on there, it makes it, use, I use three quarter inch wood. I use poplar if I'm just gonna paint it. This is poplar in the front. These are actually made out of the actual materials I would use except they're thinner plywood. So that goes in there, so if you had three quarters under there, it winds up being a, a 24 inch deep cabinet. And then typically when they put countertop on, it's 25 inches, so it covers the drawer, drawers and doors, so you have that, that depth. And that's pretty much standard. Um, toe kick is about four and a half inches high, so if you looked at side view of this, this right here is four and a half inches, and then it's three inches deep. And that's kind of the standard, pretty much everybody makes it that way. Um, and I make it, again, 34 and 5 eighths. Um, technically, a lot of people make them 34 and a half, but I give it the extra uh, 1 eighth because in the dishwashers, they have little tabs that stick out on the top of the dishwashers, and I do not want to get to the customer, and they wind up putting the countertop in, and it won't fit because it's too low. So I, I, I cheated up an eighth of an inch just to give it a little extra space so those tabs will slide in there and they won't have any problems. Um, when I make these, 
like on these drawings, like on this drawing right here, these are the two sides. That's these two sides here. I'll make five or 10 or however many it is. So I make them all at once. And I don't use the CNC, I use the table saw because I can run them so much faster. So I'll set up, I'll set it up to cut, cut these out and then I'll cut all the joints at once. And then I'll go to the next set and I'll cut all the joints at once. So I'll do all the lefts and then all the rights. And when you do that, these will all line up. Once you've set the fence, cut all these joints, all these joints here. So what I'll do is I will cut all these. So when you set the, set the fence on the table saw, if you cut all these, these are all going to be exactly the same height. So when you put the floor in there, you don't have it off a little bit this way or that way. So everything lines up perfectly. And the floors line up perfectly. Same deal with the upper sides. You just cut them all at once. That's what's on this drawing here. And that's, you cut all these sides. I generally uh, make all these at once. I just figure out how many cabinets I got and I make all the sides and do everything at once. And then I put it on the CNC and cut these. Now you, I also, before I had the CNC, I have a template, which I forgot to bring, or I've gotten rid of it, I don't know. But <laughs> I have a template with a dowel pin, so when I didn't have the CSC, CNC, I would lay these back to back and then put a square on there all the way across and drill these top four holes. I probably should do this. These top holes, drill them first, and then I have a template with spaced holes here. And then I have... Uh, a porter cable router which has the standard collets and you just go down the go down and you just drop it down and you drill all these holes and if you need to go longer you just move it down to the down to a hole down here and just go on keep going until you get the right number of holes that you want so you can make a template and, and do that as well but i wouldn't put try to do it on the drill press it's too tedious all you got to do is get these uh, starter holes here and then use a template and uh, it makes it a lot easier so, uh, and then the last thing, this does vary based on the ceiling height. So if you have a soffit, typically this would be, this height here would be 30 inches. If you don't have a soffit, it would be 42 inches because the distance between the bottom of this cabinet and the top of this one with the countertop is about 18, 19 inches or so. And uh, so that gives you your space to put toasters and whatever you put on the countertop. So those are some of the standard setups. This is what... Standard 12 inch cabinets has 11 and a quarter inches in here, and then you have the, the uh, face frame here. So you do pick up three quarters of an inch because the face frame is open. So it gives you a f uh, 12 inch cabinet. And because it sticks out all the way to the very end, you get pretty close to 12 inches internally. Uh, so that's, that's what you do is you cut all those sides out. And those are, those are there on those uh, models that I have. Okay, and then door and drawer front. Let me, let me go back real quick, one, one other thing. So I brought this. And so when you're cutting out all these joints here, you typically I would, don't use a wobble head because it'll just tear everything out and make a gigantic mess. So, but what I did is because they make the veneer on these plywoods is so thin, and this is actually pretty good because this has a finish on it. it gives a little tear outs here and I'm gonna pass this around and this drives me crazy because I'm a perfectionist, but it makes all these little chips, all these pieces out. So what I do is I will, if you're going across the grain, so that if you're cutting these joints here, going across, that's, that's what this, the grain on this happens to be this way. So you're, when you're cutting these, this would be like cutting these. It leaves this chipped out mess. And so what I do is I, First, I score it, and I run it down a 16th, no more than a 16th, just enough to score it, and you have to use a stacked dado. Do not try to use a wobble head because it'll make a mess. And then once you've done that, then without moving the fence, one more time, without moving the fence, set it to the full depth. In this case, it's 3 8 because it's a 3 quarter inch piece. Then you cut the, the full depth, and it, it leaves... Look at, I'm going to pass this around. Look at the difference between this and this. And it's, a, it's amazing the difference. And this is, again, with the stacked dado head cover. And if you buy a set of stacked dados, make sure you get the two end pieces need to look like cross-cut pieces. Freud made some that look like the wobble head, and those will make a mess. So you need to get ones that have a lot. The more teeth, the better. 
It gets you that nice smooth finish. Now if you're going with the grain, set the depth, cut it, and you're done. So these here, on the, the, two, the backs here, just set the depth. Once you get the depth, just cut the thing. I, I set the depth here, and I, I cut this, cut this, and then I just cut that. And you'll see this is clean. I didn't have to uh, do any scoring. It's just when we're going across the grain uh, in the cabinet. So just kind of a nice note to have. You can see the difference between how it cuts uh, with and with taking that little step where you can get through that top layer and get a, a nice clean cut. So doors and drawer fronts, um, you can make them just using a table saw. Yeah, they're what I call mission style doors. And if we get up real close here, these, these actually are that style. They actually have a very square setup. They still look nice. They don't have the fancy part. You need to get a router table and have router bits and style and rail bits. And you can do that. But if you just want to just do a table saw, you can actually make some attractive doors and they're what I call mission style because they're very square. And these, um, well, admittedly, I did use a CNC to make the parts. These doors I, I did make with the uh, table saw. So nothing, there was no router. No router was used to do anything on these, in these cabinets. So that's kind of a nice thing to know. So you don't have to go out and buy all these tools. If you want to build a cabinet, you could do the whole shebang with the table saw if you start with dimension lumber or use the shop to do the planing and joining. Um, more ornate profiles, again, you need the router table or a, sh or a shaper. Uh, simple profiles at the mission, as I said, are, are real nice. You can look down here, down here below. This is the mission style. And those, they would come out and they're very square. Other profiles, like this profile here, oops, this one down here, that one actually, it's hard to tell, but it has a, it's a round over, and you can do OGs and whatever they sell. There's shaker and all different kinds of styles. But then you've got to have a router table to do that, and you have to buy a style a rail and style set. And if that's what you want to do, that's fine. I've done both. Uh, the most popular thing my customers want is the mission style, which is, I mean, is, is the shaker, what I call a shaker style. And I call it that because that's what Freud calls that bit. And it's, what it does is it actually has, instead of being square here, it's just a slight bevel, but it's still very clean lines. And that seems to be the favorite, at least of all my customers right now. Um, so the hardware I use, um, I use high-end bloom hardware. I will not buy, I, I years ago I thought I can get this soft clothes slides for half price. And believe you me, I have regretted that since the day I had it. And because it's a different enough slide, the, the drawers only work on those slides. And I've come so close so many times to just taking it out, pitching the drawers, and restarting over and using balloon slides. But um, my point is don't cheap out on it. You'll, I learned my lesson, and I'm trying to pass this on to everyone else. Pay the money and get the good hardware. Um, the right hardware really gives you a nice classic look. And these slides here, these drawer slides down here, they go underneath the drawer. So when you make a drawer, and I like to make uh, use half blind dovetails, and I'll talk about that in just a second. And I want them, I mean, they're, they're there, and they're screaming, look at me, I'm gorgeous. And so you want to make sure that they see your customer sees it. So this hides under there. There's, you don't see any hardware. The thing just magically comes out and magically closed because you can't see any of that because I don't want to see any metal. I want to see wood. So that's, that's what I use. I really like these. I and mean, when you close it, it closes and it soft closes. I think probably everybody's seen all that. And then I also use the European style hinges here. Um, the nice thing about these, and I'll get into it in the next slide, that you can do uh, little adjustments to make everything fit. But these really do make a really nice uh, drawer set. These little releases here, you can pull the drawer out, pull the releases that comes out and lift the drawer out. If you want to put it back in, put it in there, kind of give it a good shove and you can hear it click and it grabs it and then it closes slowly. So it, it just has some really high-end features that you're not going to find in a lot of the cheaper, cheaper cabinets. Um, the only thing about this, now these, 
the hinges, they're the slides that I just showed you, they do have to have some pretty, pretty tight tolerances in here, and these are the tolerances you need to do. But those tolerances are totally doable on table, table saw. A, a contractor saw, you don't have, to have a fancy cabinet thing and all that, you can do, a contractor saw will do this. So, um, but you put these slides in here and you have to go through these calculations, come up with this, which is why I use CAD. When I, the program I have, I actually, I enter the size of the opening and I've set it all up where I say go and just like that, I've got all the dimensions I need and when I cut it out, it fits every single time. In fact, I've gotten to the point where I'll make all the drawers, I'll install the cabinets at the customer's house and I'll walk in there and just put the drawers in. That's how much confidence you have if you've got a CAD, you've used the CAD program for it. So this, uh, it, it's a little bit, there's a little bit of complexity to it, but it really, really gives you a really nice high quality cabinet and it, the, everything works smooth and it has the soft close and so it really is, it's an impressive uh, cabinet when you're all, when it's all done. Uh, I thought I had a, there we go. On the hinges, um, the advantage of the hinges is whenever you make the cabinet and you get it all, make it perfectly square, but when you screw it into the wall, and we're gonna get into this, the wall might not be right, so it, it could torque the, the cabinet just ever so slightly, and so when you put it in the shop and it's all square and the doors all closed, everything's great, then you put it up and you install it and then the doors are rubbing somewhere. So the advantage of having these is it allows you to tweak that out. So there's a vertical adjustment for this way, and then there's a horizontal adjustment which adjusts this way, or you can t turn, tweak the doors this way to get everything lined up, and then there's a uh, in-out adjustment. So if maybe when you screwed the cabinet in there and it, the wall kind of distorted a little bit, so you got a little, you can push on the door and feel it bonk, 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 bonk like that. So you can adjust this screw here right there, and you can adjust it out to where it, both the top and the bottom hit exactly, even though the cabinet was slightly distorted because you screwed it into the wall. And so then when it closes, everything closes, and if you touch the, you can tell I'm a massive perfectionist. You touch the doors, you can tell they're not, they're not clunking. They're all, everything's lined up and all, and when you put it in there, you want the lines to line up. You don't want you know, uneven lines, like that commercial in that car where they roll the BB around the hood, that's what I'm after. I want to have that thing line up just right. And these give you that little adjustment so you can tweak those things in and fine tune it. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna go back to this. Okay, so speaking of table saws, so I have a way, when I, I teach a course on uh, cabinet building, and so what I did is I made a Frankenstein here. And Frankenstein has four different corners with four different style of, uh, of uh, joinery here. And I'll start here, this right here, that's, that's a, uh, those are splines. They're cut through and they're put in there. They're kind of pretty. And you can, I, they're slightly different distances. You can make them together, apart. It's all part of the artistry of making a, making a drawer, which goes back to the point why you want the hardware to be underneath here so you can see this. So you, your customer will see and look at how pretty that is, okay? Then there is the through, through uh, dovetails, which go all the way through. And then we have the half blind. Those are the ones I use. Um, so the front, of the front and the back are here, and then the sides here. So when you pull, the, pull, the, uh, or when you pull it out of the cabinet, you can see the, see the, um, the, the dovetail joinery, because the whole idea is to show off how pretty it is. And then here is the box joint. And with the box joints, you can make those right off the table saw. These you gotta have a, a, router, a router and a special jig and blah, 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 blah. This you can make with a table saw also. You just need to make a, a, a slide that slides on the fence. I have a slide that fits over my fence. And then you just set it like this, the different pieces and you run it through and I have a full kerf blade and I have these shaved down to the full kerf distance and you can make those and make them whatever you want. So those are all the choices. Now the pluses and minuses, yeah, like on this joint here, you can make a box joint on the table saw, but the disadvantage, and I did this on purpose so you could see it, 
is it leaves a little hole here where if you cut these all the way around, you want to have this, the inside piece fit inside the drawer. So, but the, dis the downside is you're going to see a hole in here somewhere where the saw came out and you'll be able to look in there and you can see the, see the bottom of, the, of this. So you either A, now you're back to a router table where you plunge in, go this far and then pull out and then you don't, that, that won't be exposed, which is an alternative, which is what you could do. And you would only run the router bit halfway so then it doesn't take this piece out and then you have a clean joint all the way around. Or you could just fill it in with putty and sand it and smooth it out. So that's kind of a choice you got to make. Um, if I was doing it, I would probably make that a back and then make this the side so you can see it because the front and the back is front's going to be covered with a, typically you put a drawer front on here on cabinets and then this is the back so you're not going to see it. So on the side you wouldn't see it. It wouldn't poke through. It only poke through in the back. So those are some design choices you can make. Through dovetails, you have the exact same problem where you, you'll see this hole here. You have to do the exact same thing. You plunge down halfway, run all the way across, and pull it out, and then you can, you can hide that. But now you're back to the router table. Um, so that's basically a summary. Now the half line, you can do all the way around, and that'll be hidden because it's hidden by this by this board here, so you're not going to be able to see that hole in the side of the cabinet, as well as the, you can position these so you don't see that as well, which would be the splines. So this is Frankenstein. I use it just sort of as a sample. These are all the different, different uh, joints you can make, and I'll pass it around so you can see it. And then look, check the ones with the little holes, um, so you can see that's there. I, again, I did that on purpose because I just want to make a point that you could either fill it, you could plunge it with the router, lots of choices on what you might want to do with it. But on the box joint drawers, for the box joints, you can actually make a, a fixture that goes in your table saw and make a homemade fixture. That's how I made those. I made those with a homemade fixture. And I have three or four of them. It doesn't take very long to make. And this is right out of a set of instructions I have in a PDF file when I taught my uh, course in, uh, on cabinet building. We built some drawers. And so what we do is you have a, this is the, the channel where the table saw miter gauge goes, miter gauge goes here. I just take a, I go dumpster dive and find a three quarter inch piece of plywood. And um, then you have to make these squares. You run it through the uh, table saw with the, and I again use the uh, stack dado. And you run it through and then you make this a slot here and then you make these exactly the same width of the slot. So you have to sand it and smooth it. Once you get it the same width of the slot, then you put an indexing pin, you slide it over, you use an indexing pin, and that's how you position this in the miter gauge. And so if you take my course, you can build a fixture like this, and then that'll allow you to build box joints. But it's, again, you can do the whole shebang with the table saw, including doing the box joints for the, for the, uh, for the drawers. Um, okay, so if you order the hinges, and I forgot to bring hinges. When you order these hinges, they have a different, you can buy half inch overlay, three quarter, one, one and a quarter, and one and a half inches uh, of an overlay. So an overlay is, if you have a door or drawer front, and you have your cabinet here, there's a, a slightly little gray line here that's right along here. And that gray line is the edge of the face frame behind the door. And then the actual edge of the door is here, is this darker line right here. But the difference between there and there is called the overlay. So that's how much the door overlays on top of, the, uh, on top of your, your face frame. And you can get the different overlays because when you put all the cabs together and you run them all the way along in a big long string, you it's an aesthetic thing, but how much face frame do you sh want to show or not show? And it's sort of a call as to what's aesthetically pleasing, what does your customer want? You know, the, those are the things you need, kind of need to answer. How do I want the cabinet to look? So you can order whatever you want. I just happen to show a half inch overlay. This last kitchen I just did, I did with three quarter inch overlay, but you can get them. And if you want to have almost no face frame, then you use like a one and a half inch frame 
with a one and a quarter inch overlay and it just gives you a little quarter inch. You have only have an half an inch between the between all the cabinets and this is typically I'd make that a half an inch so you so you have the same gap all the way around. Purely aesthetics, but that gives you that option. You can get it in any different overlay that you could possibly want. So um, again, I had, I had taught a cabinet course, and we'll just go back to the 24-inch here. This is a rendering. This is what the rendering looks like. Um, basically, that's, but then I can put drawers and doors on the front of it. OK, so this is kind of something I do. As I mentioned early, earlier, you have, you're going to have 400 parts in your shop. So how are you going to keep track of it and organize it? So what I've found for me is the first thing I do is I build the face frame. So, so uh, that's a face frame, that's a face frame there. That's a, it's that open frame there. That's what the door and the drawers fit on. Okay. So when I make the face frame, that says, okay, I am this cabinet over here. That face frame says, I'm this cabinet over here. So I use the face frames as the reference. Because remember, all these sides, they can all be identical because you're making the same size. It's got to be the same height, same depth same toe kick, all that's the same. So you can get lost in that. So what I'll do is I'll use the face frame to say, OK, this stack here is this cabinet, this stack here is that one, and this stack is that one. And then I'll machine the parts. And as I make the parts, here's some of the doors and the drawers. And these are the edges here for a sink. Oh, that's a sink, sorry. That one's a sink cabinet. And this has got a trap door in there to fit the plumbing in. So. Um, this was another, these were set of vanities, so that's another trap door. But <clears throat> if you line these all up, then you can keep track, and as you machine the parts and complete the parts, you just fill in behind the face frame, and then you know it's a way of keeping track of where all the parts are and where they're going to go, because I guarantee you 400 parts is a lot of parts. I mean, an automatic transmission is going to have or five or 600 parts, so you think about an automatic transmission in your shop. I mean, that's how many parts we're talking about if you're going to build a 15-cabinet kitchen. So anyway, the face frames use it to identify it, make sure they're machine, the placing behind them, and just build it up from there. So that just helps, that helps me to keep track of all of it because it's, it's an accounting, could be an accounting nightmare. Um, so now I'm going to talk about reality. There is no, at least in the Milky Way galaxy, there is no house that is perfectly straight, flat, or square. It doesn't exist, OK? So you've got to address these problems. So you can build perfect cabinets that are perfectly square, but they're not going to fit where they are. So they're not very useful if you don't address these problems ahead of time, because you're going to be in a world of hurt trying to get through this. So I'm going to go through the main causes of why buildings are not straight or flat or square, even though they might start out that way. Um, so in order to deal with that, we'll, we'll take a look at a couple situations, one and two. So drywall joint. So when you put the drywall together and you have a joint here and you tape it and then you mud over the tape, you're going to have a slight little mound on it. And you can see in the corners, there's a little sheetrock joint here. And if you're looking down, down on the, looking this way down from the top, you'll have a little bit of mud build up here. So you can see this little build up there, and that's enough to throw you off. So it's going to be a problem, especially if you, if they have a horizontal joint and you're going to put your cabinet in here. Now you've got this bow here, and you're going to have a gap here or a gap here, and it's going to rock. So you've got issues with that. And down here, you've got this corner joint. This has been mudded in, so that's, the cabinet's gonna, not going to sit flat. It's going to sit cockeyed like this. So you've got to address these things that are, that are going to become issues. Um, so we'll, situations three or four for the, for, for the lower ones. But there are structural issues. All floor joists are eventually, if you have a wall and a foundation here, the floor joist is going to go down like this and then come back up to the other part of the foundation or the beam in the middle of your house. So you're going to have a bowl here. And you don't know it. You can walk around it forever. But when you start putting cabinets in, the cabinet's going to sit. It's going to be a little bit cockeyed that way. So you're going to, it's going to have a gap here and, the, here and, then, and then you'll be against the wall here. So 
you, you have to shim it up against the wall, but remember, now you've got drywall joints. So is it sitting on a drywall joint? Is it not straight? So you're gonna have to deal with that. Um, then there's warped wall studs. So even if you're vertical, you don't, you're not even sitting on a, on a uh, mudded joint, you're still gonna have a stud that maybe has a little bow in or a bow out. So you've gotta deal with that. So all these things all add up to being problems. So you need to design for it and plan for it. So on these cabinets, and they are scale models, and they have these little features to them. In the back here, and we probably come up after the presentation, you can feel I actually have, this actually sticks out slightly. So you have a little bump here, same thing with this one, you got a bump in the back. And what this bump is for is if you happen to be lucky and you put it up there and everything's straight and square, great, you just had a nice day. Probably won't happen. So what you do is you put it up there and you take a pair of, uh, basically a compass if you want, and you run it down here and if you've got a gap here, you start here and you run down here or maybe there's a gap you know, drywall joint here and there's a gap here and here. So you start at the gap and you run the compass down and it'll make a pencil mark down like this. I'll exaggerate like maybe like this, okay? And so then this I usually make either an eighth or a quarter of an inch sticking out. And then you take a belt sander and you set the cabinet down. Keep the doors closed. Set the cabinet down and you run the belt sander and you run it so the belt is going this way. Not this way, because you're going to tear it all out. And if this is the last cabinet, you're going to have a gigantic mess and you're going to make a new cabinet. So do not have the belt going this way. Make sure it's always going this way or going this way. And that's what this is here. Make sure the belt is always going to the inside. If you tear this up and booger it up, nobody's going to see it. You're not going to care. So you put the belt sander on there and you run it. And you run it along here and you, you gradually sand off and you sand it off to the point where you get, get that, hit that line right there and when you put the cabinet up there, it won't be straight but it'll match the wall and you won't be able to see it with your eyes. It won't be any worse than the joint all by itself. So that's why these little tabs here are there for a reason. So that's, that's kind of a, a, a big deal because you're gonna have to deal with that when you install the cabinets, whether it's a vanity or a kitchen or anything that's going in the house. Um, okay, so um, for uneven horizontal walls, so if you're going along, let's just say you're looking down and you've got the wall, you're looking down, this is the top of the cabinet, so we're looking at the cabinet like this. And the wall's going like this and over and over like this, so you've got all this whole issue here. Well, if the wall is going like this, okay, you can, you can pull these together and I, there's, there's a tab here and there's a tab here. And that's there so when you put it together, the, you'll pull this cabinet together and you get a very tight joint because you want that joint to be absolutely closed so the customer can't see a gap in there. You want it to be closed up nice and tight because you're gonna, gonna see it. So you screw it in there and put it together. Now, I had this stick out because one, I want this to touch here, not here. And I usually give it a sixteenth of an inch and a sixteenth of an inch on the other cabinet, so you have an eighth of an inch gap here. So if the cabinets have to come together in the back, you can still have room to pull them together, but still pull this closed and get a closed joint. If the cabinets, if the wall goes, goes the other way for the back of the cabinets have to come out, then you can just screw it in and you're okay. But it gives you that ability to line the cabinets up with the wall if it's not perfectly straight. It gives you some, some slop in there so you can handle that. Now, personally, if you, if you go out and you go to Home Depot or whoever and you buy your cabinets, they're made, they're standard cabinets and they're made by a 24 inch cabinet or whatever. It's on there, you'll have it finished on both sides and you'll have this, you'll be able to see this, but it'll be finished, okay? but that's not good enough as far as I'm concerned because I'm building a custom cabinet just for that, for that person. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll build this, but before I finish it, I'll take the router with a, uh, with a um, pattern cutting bit and I'll cut that off and then I'll sand it, fill it, smooth it, and now you get a perfectly smooth 
end of the cabinet. So it has a very, it's made for that position. So if it's the last cabinet of the row, then I'll make this perfectly smooth so that you can, it'll have a very finished look and you won't have that piece sticking out there because I don't like it. So that's why I, I do that. Because I, I want my customers, when they see it, I want them to say, hey, you know, this is, this is made just for me. Um, so here's the gap. Again, it's hidden because you screw these together and when they put the countertop in, that gap's completely hidden. So you don't have to worry about that. Um, I also, if you have multiple uh, cabinets in a line, I try to get a full length stock of, of toe kick backer, which is, when you look at this cabinet, it has a backer and then it has the pretty part up here and this is sprayed. And what I'll do is, is I'll have backers on the cabinets, but then if I have a long row of cabinets going down this way, I'll just have a single toe kick all the way down so there's no seams on the, down below. It's just a, it's a continuous uh, length, so you don't, you don't want to see any joiner or seams or anything like that. So, <coughs> um, let's see. Okay, so the main thing here so here's, here's the classic joist where I talked about where it's turned into a bowl like this. So down here, because it goes down like this, you'll probably, you probably want to put a shim in there. So you'll shim it up and you'll put the shim right under here and raise it up a little bit to get it to make up for this gap here. So the cabinet's going to be sitting up just a little bit. So what you want to do, though, when you install the cabinet, you want to have you want to have a gap here that's ugly. You want ugly. You want beautiful. So what you do is you get all the cabinets in. You get them level, flat, everything just straight. So when the countertop people come in, they got a nice flat set of cabinets. And then at the very last step, you take the take finish one end of the toe kick on the finish board, and you put it in there, and you drop it down. You drop it down so it hits the floor. There might be a gap here, but the sight line, you're not going to be able to see that gap at all. But you will be able to see it if you put it up against the bottom of the cabinet. So what I do is I put it all the way down on the floor and then attach it. I usually use like a silicone um, sealer of some kind and stick it on there. I glue it because I don't want you want to be able to see any nail holes. So, but it sets on the floor. So. Even though you've got some shims here and the front's up a little bit, the toe kick, it, until everything's already put in, the last step is put the toe kick in and then set it right on the floor. So then it looks like, well, the floor is perfect. Not really. You're just hiding the problem up in here. But you can't see it because when you're looking at it, it, you know, you got an angle like this. So that's just a little trick to make it look real pretty. To make it, uh, so these are a lot of the little tricks tricks of the trade to really get it to everything to look fantastic. And so that's basically in a nutshell, I know I hit a lot on, on problems with houses and doing installation, but it's a, it becomes a big deal. And if you don't plan for it, it it's a huge headache. And, but it comes, goes pretty well um, if you have everything designed for that reason. So any questions? Microphone. Yeah, how'd you get started in all of this, Don? Um, I had a, uh, one of my wife's friends wanted to, I started my business and they wanted, they wanted a uh, set of kitchen cabinets, so I was gonna do that. I put them together and I was kind of stressing over, well, how am I gonna hold them up and do all this? Well, the person that I had worked with said he has somebody that has him do this handiwork. He does plumbing and all this. He's a handyman, he's doing it for forever. And so we started working on it and he helped me and do the installation. And I said, hey, you know, this, we could do this as a business. And he said, yeah. So he, he's been doing it forever. So he knows all these people. And he said, I'm warning you, better watch out because you could have more than you can handle. He was right. And so uh, he knows so many people that he goes out and he gets this work in. And he'll, he'll go out and he'll do some plumbing or some work for him. He says, and they're saying, yeah, this kitchen's so ugly. And I said, well, I know a guy. And so, <laughs> and so I got more, more work than imagined. And I've gotten a lot faster at it. I don't know how many kitchens I've done. Like I said, I just finished one yesterday. I just installed it and everything. So uh, it, 
That's, that's how, it, so it's gone to between either kitchens or vanities, kitchens and vanities. And I've done, sure, I've done a sprinkling of, um, like there was a company, uh, Arch Engraving, and they build trophies and so on, and they may have some special wood, like, like Norwood Country Club had these plaques, and they were walnut plaques, but they were all made out of walnut sapwood, not heartwood. And I said, I don't want that, so I'm going down to, <laughs> go down to, uh, sh uh, to Shaller Hardwoods, who is my supplier, and I said, okay, where's your crappiest wood? <laughs> so I went through there. So they said, oh, we've got a lot of crappy wood over here. And I said, okay, well, I want that, because it was light. It's the sapwood, and I built this thing out of sapwood, and it exactly matched the other one, and I used the CNC to make the, because the thing was, it had to have been, 30 years old, but anyway, I used the CNC to cut it out and then make the, uh, you know, the profile that goes around the edge of it, but the key was getting the, the wood. So those are the kind of projects I've been doing. So yeah, I don't only do cabinets, but um, I wound up doing a lot of those because there's just a huge demand for it, and uh, so that's kind of... Okay, next question. Um, do you do one project at a time? Um, Usually, and, and I, a follow-up, how many projects do you have backlogged? I usually do, uh, I'll take up to three at a time if they're small. So I can do, a, if I do a kitchen, I'm just doing one kitchen. But if I have a, a vanity, just a single vanity, I'll do that with the kitchen. And then if I'm doing a plaque or something like that, I'll, I'll do some small ones. And then, um, so that's, that's kind of how it's set up. Um, so I've been in business for five years and... I've been going out of business for five years and I still keep getting work. So the answer is I've burned down my backlog, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna get more. I have two people I'm gonna call, I'll probably go with two more possible customers coming in here. So um, I don't mind taking a little break because I'm actually I'm working seven days a week. <laughs> so I love it, it's, it's fun. I mean, this was a hobby and it's just basically spun out of control. So that's kind of where I am right now. But it's, uh, but yeah, I've, I've never hurt for work. And um, I do have, um, my wife wants a kitchen. And we don't have a new kitchen. And everyone else does. And so, uh, well, I hope, I hope she's not watching this. I probably should not have said anything. But uh, yeah, but. Yeah, they, they, uh, it's pretty neat because you can really, when you get pretty good at it, and, and I, I use the same spray equipment as they use for as a, in an auto body shop so I can get really nice finishes. I work with lacquers, and uh, they just make a smooth, just beautiful finish. And uh, so it's, uh, it's kind of rewarding because you, you can get some pretty happy customers. I... Uh, this last customer, actually, they went to Home Depot and Lowe's and all these other outfits. And they said, well, we want a cam that can do this. Can you do that? No. Well, what about over here? We'd like this. No, we can't do that. So then they got a hold of me and said, yeah, OK, what do you want? OK, and so we made it. So that, that's sort of my niche is I can make these one-off pieces that nobody else will make because that's what I do. So, uh, so that's sort of the, the advantage of coming with mine. And plus, I, I tell them I will, not, I will not bid and I will not build crappy cabinets. So if you get it, it's the best, the top, they're real live three quarter inch plywood. I use real dovetails with real wood. I don't use the plywood drawers with plywood dovetails. Don't do any of that. It's I'm basically building furniture for kitchens and baths. So that's kind of where I'm coming from is that and that's why I do the whole balloon hinges and slides because I want to get the best quality I can possibly get for my customers so uh, yeah it's kept me pretty busy anything else I've got 200 questions for you no, okay I, I've only got two okay first uh, one okay first one is how do you line up the cabinets on the drywall do you use a laser line or do you use how do you do the art? Well, I use, or would use a laser line, but the guy I work with, he basically uses a level, 
and then we screw in a, because typically there's going to be a backsplash behind it. This is, these are for the uppers. There's a black sp backsplash behind it, so we'll put, use a level, then we'll screw a board in the bottom, and then, then we'll, so we'll, we'll set the depth, the height from the floor to the bottom of the cabinets. Well, okay, let me back up. I always put the uppers in before you put the lowers in, because you, you can stand right up there and put it up, otherwise you're trying to do this, and then my back isn't exactly feeling good anyway. So you basically want to, Put it, you want to stand right underneath it. The disadvantage of my cabinets are a little bit, a little heavier than the Chinese particle board sold at Lowe's and Home Depot. So there's a little weight there. But we'll put a, uh, we'll put a long board there. You know, run it through the jar and get it straight. And get it level and just straight. And then you screw it in there. And then you put the, uh, you put the cabinets up. I personally, I, I have a laser level, and I would just use a laser, but. He just likes to do it the old way, so we just do it. I'm okay with that because he's very particular about his work, so I'm more than happy to do it his way because he, he, he wants it just right. He keeps me, he, he keeps me in check. And uh, so we actually put that up. So what we'll do is we'll screw the board in there, and then you can take the cabinet and you push it up, and you don't, you're not holding it like this, trying to screw it in. You just put it up there, and it's sitting on that, and so one of us holds the cabinet, that one goes up a step ladder and drives the top screws in. And once the two screws are in there, or three, um, then you can like take the board off and you're good to go. And put two down in the bottom. Uh, but you just use the uh, what is it, number ten? We use the uh, uh, structural screws, not drywall screws, but they're actual. You can buy them at Home Depot and Lowe's. And drive them in there. They have a star drive. The ceramic and, screws. Yeah, and okay. so they'll they'll hold they'll hold the cabinets and all the weight. I have, I have no doubt the cabinets will hold the weight, just making sure that the, they'll stay out. So, my, my other question has to do with the finish. Uh, do you use a high volume, low pressure sprayer? And if a person wants a brush finish on it, do you go back over with a brush afterwards? Wow, it's still wet. Um, I've never had a request for a brush finish. Um, but yes, I use an HVLP sprayer. It's the same thing you find in an auto body shop. Don't buy a cheap sprayer, buy a good sprayer. Um, you'll be rewarded with, with really good results. I, the ones I happen to have is an Apollo. I have all Apollo guns. Um, but I have, um, the, the, I have three from them. One is the cheapy $75 one, and I use that one to spray. Um, if I'm spraying latex or something like that for some projects. And then the second one up, which is my favorite, I use that one the most. I've had it the longest. Um, that's just an HVLP, and then I have another one. That one's sort of like a Cadillac, and this other one is like a Rolls Royce. It does, it does. I bought it so I could use it with a pressure pod. You actually have a half a gallon here, and you put a pressure on it, and you spray, and then you can. You don't have a cup. It feeds from this pressure pod, and if you're spraying a kitchen, you can spray a whole half gallon at a time, so you can, you know, spray all these doors and so on. Don, so that's what I use. Don, where did you get those sprayers from? I ordered them from from Apollo, um, but you know, there's I think there's like East is it Eastman? There's there's lots of different brands. I'm not trying to sell that particular brand. That just happened to be the one. I uh, talked with Scott Wonder. He's the one that got me to start spraying. He warned me that if you spray, you'll never pick up a paintbrush again. And unfortunately, he proved to be correct because the, the finish is just just so perfect <laughs> and you put it on there and, and what i'll do is when i i will spray an initial coat of primer sand it get it smooth put a second coat of primer on there sand it and get it smooth and then if you have some luck i can usually get it one one top coat now if there's an issue with the door because when you spray it you might see a little imperfection here and there because when you do the uh, do the primer it's flat so you know, it's gonna kind of it could hide some little indentations or issues, and then when you spray the sat, I usually use a sat typically. I don't use gloss. I don't want it to look like a car fender. So I uh, spray the satin, but it's still gonna show. If there's enough sheen in it, you might see where it, there might be like you sanded the door and the the rail and the style put together. You might see a little ridge there. So I sand it out and then put a, a second coat of the top coat. But if I don't see any of those, then, then we're good to go with the taco. So I can get, 
70% of the time I can get it. If you really do a good job with the primer, you can, a lot of times you can get it with one top coat. But uh, if you find an issue, then you, and I, if I'm gonna do a fix on that, I like to wait one, wait a full day, uh, one overnight, because um, the lacquer dries very quickly, it's like shellac. But the problem is, yeah, and you can sand it after an hour, but if you sand too aggressively, it's not cured down to the wood or down to the primer. So if you sand too aggressively, you'll start getting the uncured part and it'll start rolling and having issues. So you can only do a light sanding. But if you have a big enough problem and you really need to do some serious sanding, then let it cure overnight, re-sand it. And a lot of times if you don't, you can break through the top coat as long as you don't break down to the bare wood then you should be able to just put another top coat on it and you should be good to go. And that's probably a long discussion on that. Thank you. We could go on and on about finishes. Don, I was curious, how do you price this? Do you price it by the linear foot? Each cabinet have a, yeah. a price or how does that work? So I have it, um, I have a spreadsheet and I've got I've got different lower cabinets, different upper cabinets. I have a corner cabinet for a Lazy Susan, a corner cabinet. So I have several different situations that are fairly standard situations. So if I'm gonna make a 22 inch cabinet, I'm gonna, get, I'm gonna estimate on a 24 inch cabinet, okay? And so what I'll do is I have a spreadsheet and I have all the wood prices and I call up my buddies at Schaller, they're, they're my heroes, them and Compi, they're fantastic too. And um, I call them up and I get the prices on the wood, okay? And I enter the prices. And then I go down there and I go through my rendering from my CAD program and I have, oh, okay, I'm gonna have one of these, is two of these cabinets and then another one that's shorter and I have a corner cabinet and I have four of these. And I enter the numbers in there and the numbers actually go into the spreadsheet. It adds it all up. I have to charge sales tax because I'm an LLC sales taxes in there, and then the guy that helps me, I put his labor in there. And so I have a labor rate, and I can change that one number. And then I, once I enter all the cabinets and all that, and like that, here's your number. And the people say, well, how are you gonna price it? And I said, it's all in the spreadsheet. That's what it is. <laughs> There's no negotiation, because I've got everything priced based on the size, the cabinet, what the plywood is. I just need to know the price of the plywood. So I have everything set up. I've been doing this for five years, yeah. so. I have it set up so I can come up with an estimate really fast. The key thing is to, is I use the CAD program to come up, lay out the kitchen, and then I know which, what all the cabinets are, and I can go through and make sure I don't miss a cabinet, and I enter those numbers into the spreadsheet, and then it pops out an answer, and that's what I, that's what I use, so. What CAD program do you use? Uh, TurboCAD, so they're, there's so many of them out there. I like TurboCAD because I can do a rendering and I can take this here and I go, they have drawing tools and I can go in here and I can f go to my model. I'll pull up this piece, I'll select it. I'll make it, make it an object, make it an object. Then I go to the paper space. So there's a modeler's tabs along the bottom. The bottom here is the model, which has the rendering and the, all the fancy stuff. And I have even have the handles and all that. Okay, and then I go over here and I'm gonna actually make it. I use it, I make an object, and then I go to the paper space, which is this, and I slide the object on there, it drops it on there, and then it, it'll actually pull the dimensions off. So I just go through and I pull off the dimensions for what I have, and it gives me my dimensions, and that's the beauty of it, because now if I build to this, it's gonna fit that model. And that's, that's why I use CAD. If you're making 400 parts, I mean, yeah, okay, I'll give you, these are, you're making five of these the same and six of those the same, I give you that. But still, you're making the drawers and the, this just goes on and on. And somebody, and, and remember, I make special cases, so I'll make a 22 and a half inch cabinet. Not a 24, not an 18, 22 and a half, because that, that's what they want to fit in that spot. So that's why I use the CAD programs, because I'll go in there and make a special special case and and I like they have those those new microwaves that they come out that go in islands and down below they're not on the counter but they're not up there so I have a special cabinet that I just 
have priced out. I've made three of them now because those are they're using those drawer. So that goes in there, and uh, so that's those are the kind of things I have that I price out. And it is, and as you get get better and better over time, and you learn all the pitfalls like I was just showing you there. And some of those I learned from Scott. I worked with Scott for a couple of years, Scott Wonder for a couple of years, and picked some of that stuff up. But then I got too much business. I just couldn't. I couldn't. I just didn't have time. So. <laughs> so the rule of thumb is you probably want to reconsider retiring because you could get too busy. <laughs> What would you say the average time breakdown for a medium-sized kitchen is? Um, well, I've gotten a lot better at it, but I can actually build. This last one was a 12-cabinet kitchen, and I, it took me about six weeks to build it. Because um, remember, I, I'm taking vacations. I am theoretically retired, OK, <laughs> in theory. So. But I would say six, maybe eight, six to eight weeks. But I've been doing it for five years, so I, I know I'm going to make all these parts the same and all those parts the same. Because once I set up the table saw or the, or a machine, I want to set it up and I want to make all the parts on that setup, and then I'll go to the next step. And so having that, you have to have the experience to know. Okay, I know I need to make all these parts because if you make three parts and they say, oh, I need two more of the same. Now you've got to set the whole machine up. And, you know, so it, it really affects your efficiency. So your first time through, it's, it could take three or four months to, to go through it all. And, and from beginning to end, it can probably be a four or five month job because I'll be working in another kitchen, but I'll also be working the CAD program and the model for the next customer. So I'll be working on that, and they want, because I want to make, give them exactly what they want. So uh, in order to do that, there's back and forth. And they, so a lot of the customers, first off, I've had, I've been very fortunate. I've had the best customers. They're the best people I've ever dealt with in the world. They're, they're really fantastic customers. And secondly, they come up with these cool ideas that I'll take in. I'll say, what about this <laughs> to the next customer? And thinking, oh, that's pretty neat. So. I, like I've made a couple islands that just this this one customer that it had a built-in microwave and it had something it had all this stuff on it, but he says I want it to look like a piece of furniture. He says I'm all about that. So what we did was we made these and had these big legs on the sides. They're actually hollow, but they're like this big on all four corners, and then they were framed in with the uh, with strips, you know, and there were panels and it it looked like a giant piece of furniture, but it was. A, an island for the kitchen. So, so the next customer I got, I kind of said, well, what about doing this? And I showed them that, and they thought, yeah, that'd be great. So, so actually, I got that idea from working with my previous customer. And so they I kind of, it's not, they're not copyrighted ideas, so I think I can use them. <laughs> <laughs> but it really works out well, because they really, uh, I've just had, the customers I've had have been fantastic. So. So anything else? Oh, question in the back. Uh, you say you use lacquer for your finish? Yeah, I'm had a love affair with lacquer for several years now. It just um, the the problem is is okay. There is an issue. I buy it, but it's because um, I have a business. You can't really. I'm not aware that you can buy lacquer, go to, to a retail store and buy lacquer. I, I give you that. So they have cabinet, it's a waterborne finishes that are cabinet finishes that are pretty hard. I like the, ca the lacquer because it is so hard and it dries quickly so I can go to the next step. Um, but you are dealing with, you've got to wear a mask. Well, you, uh, let me back up. If you're spraying, you should be wearing a mask with an OV filter, organic vapor filter. That's the kind that, that it's the rubber mask. It's not the COVID N95. That's a piece of crap that will not protect you. You need a, a mask like the gas mask from World War I kind of thing. And you've got this here, and you've got the two 
filters, and you got, get an OV filter, <clears throat> and I'm spraying lacquer, and it is obnoxious. You put that thing on there, if you even get a hint of a slight of a tiny little hint of a whiff of it, then you just need to adjust the mask. It is so effective. So I am a big believer, if you're spraying, you should be wearing a mask, because that stuff gets in your lungs. You don't want it in there. So, so, you, so you have a commercial spray booth and everything then? Well, no. I, <laughs> uh -huh. What I do is I actually spray outside. I have, luckily, in my shop, I have, I've taken over the whole basement, okay? Oh. And so I have a, we have a screened-in porch, and below the screened-in porch is an open area, which we've made another open porch. Uh -huh. And I spray out there. I have a spray tent, and I put the tent up, and then I spray... And then our house has a big, long front porch. So I take the doors and I go around to the front porch and I have a bunch of stands and I let, that's my drying area. And I come back over and go to the tent and spray this one and come back over. So I have a whole, whole method on, on spraying, but I will not spray in the shop because it, yeah, and, and the beauty of lacquer is I can spray, the limitation is me. When it gets down into the 30s, my hands don't work so well on the gun. Mm -hmm. So, but lacquer doesn't care. It'll take a little longer to cure, but it doesn't affect it. Now, waterborne, that's a big issue. You've got to make sure you're above 50 and all that. But with lacquer, I could probably spray at zero degrees. It's just that my hands don't work. So I, I try to spray at 45 degrees and up. And then, um, but with the waterborne, you could probably spray at least down into the 50s and, and get that, spray that. I haven't done any, um, I like shellac. I use that to do a lot of sealing, um, but I haven't actually uh, sprayed it, but I would think it would be a really nice thing to spray also. I've just never done it. Um, so, and I used to do polyurethane before uh, Scott Wonder ruined me and got me into lacquers and now I can't quit. So, and then um, I also spray conversion varnish. Right. And that is probably the toughest finish ever. I mean, the only thing that will eat through it is if you put high strength sulfuric acid on it. That's the only thing that will attack it. I mean, I've, I've sprayed in the cabs before. I, I, a long time ago, I used to spray uh, conversion varnish on the interiors, but I've gotten too much work. I just, so I just buy the pre finished plywood and work with that, which is what I've passed around. So, um, but like the drawers and so on, I'll just spray with a conversion varnish. And um, that stuff is a very, I usually spray the clear version of it, but it's post-catalyzed, meaning you have to add the catalyst and mix it. And so you've got that hassle with that. Um, the plus side is that I've never seen such a forgiving finish. I mean, you can screw up and it just knows, I, I know you want it to look like this and it just, <laughs> It levels out, it's just, so, but the disadvantage is you've got, once you catalyze it, you have to use all of it, and what you don't use, you have to throw away. So I have a recycled container, and you just dump it and get rid of it, so. What, what brand of finish is that, the, the post-catalyzed? I use, uh, I use ML Campbell, they're out mm -hmm. of Ontario. Yeah. Um, but there's a lot of Target makes finishes, and um, I think, uh, Dan Lender, you've done a lot of work with some airborne. Waterborne, I meant. I, yeah. I spray almost exclusively. Yeah. So there's there are options out there uh, that that you can use, and they do make a real nice cabinet finish. That's a it's a nice hard finish. Either way, you should still be wearing a mask. Yeah. It's like wearing safety glasses. You need to have a mask. And uh, I don't wear safety glasses when I spray, but um, do wear I do wear that mask. So and even though I'm spraying outside. So I am a little bit, uh, when I'm working on the cabinets, you know, it's, uh, what's the weather tomorrow? Oh, I got to get done. I'm going to work late tonight so I can set up. And, you know, the winter time is a in, out, in, you know. <laughs> in the summertime, um, I basically, you know, you can basically spray whenever you want. With the lacquers, you do have to use something called a retarder, which is you mix it in and you thin it. You, gotta, you thin it anyway because you want to have a real nice finish. You don't want the dreaded orange peel, which is a little little bumps and so on in your finish. But the, the um, retarder will slow, down, slow it down because you get up to 70 and 80 degrees, it dries fast. And by the time you're, if you're spraying a door, you go to here, 
and you come back to spray again, that's already dried, and then the overspray leaves a, a little ridge along here, so you've got these ridges down the door. So what you do is you mix this retarder in, and it slows it down so you can get all the way to the end, go all the way back, and that's not totally dry yet, so, it, so the overspray uh, you know, levels into that previous uh, uh, streak or, or you know, run that you did. So it doesn't, you don't get the streaks. So those are probably more information than you need, but. Uh, right. Um, so as far as table saws, do you have anything special that, uh, you know what I mean, like a, a um, big panel saw well, or sliding table or something? I have, no, it's a, it's the last generation of the Delta Unisaw. Uh, I okay. love that machine to no end. It is a fantastic machine. So I, I dread the day if I can't get a part for it because, you know, Delta doesn't make them anymore, but. Um, I mean, I've gotten to the point, I don't even, I don't measure anymore. And if I'm cutting a bevel and I want a 22 and a half degrees, I set it there and I don't even measure it. I just cut it and it's 22 and a half every time. And when I want to split, if I want to rip a board and I set it to six and a quarter inches, it will split the pen pencil line on six and a quarter inches. So I, I just dread the day if there's a problem and I can't, <laughs> I can't get a part for it. So I guess I would get a Powermatic or something if I had to, but I, I would search high and low to avoid having to get rid of that machine if everything happened to it, because it's just, uh, the, 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 the bevel adjustment, it's a big dial. You know, most of them have the, the pointer like this, you know, and so you're gonna wind up, you wanna measure and chuck it. This has a dial and it has a, the dial goes around and it's got a little sliver and you cut the sliver through, and if you want it 30 degrees, you put that sliver on the 30, and boy, it's dead nuts on. So, and so I don't, it's so nice because I don't have to measure stuff. I just, if I want six and a quarter inch wide board, it's, it's there, and I don't have to do all the measuring and checking to make sure it's right. Now, if I do change to a full curve blade, then I, you know, I got to, I have a used thin curve blade, so if I go to a full curve, I need to, I will have to measure it, so because then it won't be set up for that. So, so, so thank that, you so much, Don. All right, it's wonderfully done as expected. There. <laughs> I want to <laughs> apologize to Hal Donovan because I forgot on my it was even on my one of oh, my thanks. slides we were going to do a, a video of the Quinn saw. Um, tour that, that we did in recent past. Uh, I think it's online probably, Hal, with a link on the website. So highly recommended if you, don't, if you didn't look at it before, but we'll put it on for the next time. So I'm so sorry, I forgot to do that. Uh, remember on your way out to, if you wanted to look at the telescope and the base and so on, to do that as you're leaving. And finally, if anybody doesn't have anything else, Bob, would you at least mention the next month's um, program? Next month is going to be River Table Designs demonstrations with uh, Chris Linebroker. He's with Rockler, and uh, he's going to show us how to build river tables. That's what's going to be next month. So, Thank you. Any other questions? Have a good rest of your evening. See you next next month. <laughs>